Well, today we're going to be uh, turning in the, in the Gospels to Luke chapter 10, and so I invite you to turn there with me uh, as we consider today uh, this portion of text uh, when uh, our Lord Jesus Christ sends out his disciples. It's good to be with you today, and as you know, some of, some of you know I was here in the evening of a few weeks ago, so we're glad to be here in the morning this time. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Julie and I were in uh, northern Idaho. We were vi- there for a family visit. We were there also for a wedding. And it, it's, it's harvest time in that part of the, of the country right now. They're harvesting wheat in northern Idaho, in eastern Washington, and northern Oregon, northeast Oregon. Uh, the fields are, are uh, clearly ready for the grain to be brought in. And there was a lot of activity when we were there. I, I always liked seeing in that part of the country, there were these steep hills, and some of the combines are designed to operate on a slant. Uh, they, can, uh, they can tilt up to 25 or so degrees to keep the grain from spilling out of the hopper and maintain balance on the side of those steep hills. But today, we're going to look at a text uh, that speaks about a different kind of harvest. And I'll read for you, starting in, if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1, reading through verse 24. I'm going to be reading, I think probably we might have the words on the screen here. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. I think uh, perhaps it might be the New American Standard that will be displayed, but they're, they're fairly similar. And so uh, here now the reading of God's Word. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For the mighty works done in you had, had if, it, if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Sidon or for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, The Lord, even the, de- Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom 
the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. And I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's, let's uh, look to him again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that these are the words of life. We ask that now you open our eyes, open our ears to receive them, that we might, Lord, Lord, learn about you. We might learn how, Lord, we may serve you and how we may live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to look, as I mentioned, at this portion of Scripture that we've just read. And Jesus says that there is a harvest. He says in, uh, in, uh, in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so he's sending out his disciples into the harvest. Note that the text that you have in front of you in the New American Center, I think it's 70 in the ESV, it's 72. Different manuscripts have different numbers. But this is, a, this is an incident that is, is, I think, unique to Luke's gospel. A, a chapter earlier, if we were to flip back a chapter earlier, we would see that there's another incident when Jesus sends out just the 12. But here he is sending out the 72. I think it's pr probably 72. Uh, some have tried to make a, a link between 70 and the 70 elders uh, that assisted Moses, as uh, we read in Exodus chapter, I think, 11. But but uh, whether it's 70 or 72, Jesus is sending them out two by two with uh, a certain mission. And so uh, we should be, first of all, glad to see that there were that many that were following Jesus. Maybe sometimes we think there was only a few that w w were with him, uh, the disciples and maybe one or two others. But at this mo moment in Jesus' earthly ministry, there were a number that were following him. And what I'd like to do today is look at this passage that we've just read under four heads. And so for the first 12 verses, we're going to look at the instruction that Jesus gives uh, to the harvest workers. In verses 13 to 16, we're going to look at a warning against unbelief. And then we're going to see in verses 17 through 20, the response of faith. And finally, in verses 21 to 24, uh, the joy of our Lord, the joy of Jesus Christ. But we start with the instruction in the first 12 verses of this passage, the, the instruction that Jesus gives to the harvest workers. Um, we see here a picture, as we mentioned, of, of a harvest. There is other places in uh, the Gospels where that image is used by our Lord, perhaps in the most clear places in Matthew chapter 13. There are those particular uh, harvest uh, type of um, parables that Jesus tells us. And one of them is about the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and, and the weeds. And Jesus says uh, to the harvesters to let both grow again until the harvest and then go out and gather the weeds first, bundle them up, burn them, and then bring the wheat into the barn. But at this moment in time, the harvest is ready. And those of you who know something about uh, uh, the time to bear, to go out and when fruit is to be born and it's time to gather the harvest, there's, there's an urgency uh, at, at that harvest time. If you wait too long, the grain may fall on the ground or it may be destroyed by the weather. Uh, and so there's an urgency and there is a great need. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's an abundant harvest that Jesus is drawing attention to. And it's interesting to, th to look at what Jesus uh, recommends at this moment in time. He says that we are to pray. We are to pray. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Uh, it reminds us that we need to be praying uh, for the harvest. Jesus doesn't at this moment say, well, let's come together, get a committee together and come up with objectives and mission statements and so forth, coming up with an implementation plan, but rather uh, pray. It might seem simple, but that, also, that always should be our first, our first inclination is we ought to lift these matters up to the Lord and ask that God would do it. It doesn't say that planning isn't important. Of course, it is. There are there's a time and a place for that. But 
but Jesus is, is, is uh, reminding His disciples that uh, we should pray because if the Lord is not building the house, they labor in vain who do it. So it's very necessary to bring these matters uh, to pray uh, and to pray about them. And that urgency carries over in the, in the instructions that he gives in verse, in verse 4. He says, carry no money bag, carry no knapsack, no sandals. In other words, travel light, get on your way, and don't, don't even greet um, those on the highway. You might think that's a bit rude. Shouldn't we at least say hello, greetings, peace be with you? And of course, in the, in the, in the Near East, there is a, there's quite a procedure. If you see someone on the road, if you extend a greeting to them, it could sometimes turn into a several-hour affair. You might be invited into their home for tea or, or nourishment or spend the night lodging. And so Jesus is saying, don't, don't be waylaid by that, but carry on as much as you, as, and, and, and don't be uh, distracted, but carry on and move on and, and uh, uh, fulfill the mission, keep going. And so Jesus is, is giving this instruction that they are, are to, to uh, be deliberate. And then we see down in, as we go into verse 5, uh, there, are, there is an instruction given about the attitude that the disciples should have as they go into, into the, uh, as, they're, as they're invited into the, in the homes of various people in different cities. Uh, they are to be receiving the offers of the first who invite them in. Uh, of course, the, the laborer, it says in, chapter, in verse 7, the laborer is, is worthy of his wages. Uh, but we might, you might ask, why is it that Jesus says, do not go from house to house? And I think it's because uh, Jesus is, is, of course, emphasize, wants to emphasize with his disciples, first of all, not to, not to offend those who would host the the 72 as they reach their homes, but also to perhaps put an emphasis on the fact that their circumstances are not more important to them than the mission that they're to accomplish. Their mission is actually the most important thing. I think that's, that's true for us today in our, own, in our own lives. Sometimes we get uh, distracted by our circumstance. Sometimes we think we wish we had a different job or a better house or you know, some other circumstance, and we can be distracted by that. But, but, in fact, Jesus wants his disciples to focus upon the mission of going forth and preparing the way for him because he has said he is going to be coming to these, these uh, towns uh, very soon. So we need to also have that attitude as well. We need to, uh, we need to uh, seek to be thankful for the circumstances that God has placed us in and pray that the Lord will use us in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. And then we get to uh, verse 9, and we find the particular instruction for what these 72 disciples are to do. They're, first of all, they're to heal the sick. They're to heal the sick. This was, of course, um, something that Jesus did in his own ministry as well. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that when the final king would come, when the great Messiah would come, there would be uh, the occasion of healing. And it's a demonstration, of course, in, in the case of those that are sent by our Lord Jesus Christ, that they go with his authority. They go with his power, that he can actually heal those who are sick. But they're also to declare that the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's come near in the demonstration of this power, but of course, in the person of, of and, the, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is coming into those places. That is indeed the coming of the kingdom. Uh, they were announcing that Jesus was near, but he was going to be coming uh, in his own person and work very, very soon. Now, we also see that he gives them uh, a protocol, if you like, for those that do not receive him, starting in verse 10. There are some that are not going to receive our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, uh, whenever you enter such a town, and uh, you, uh, you, you should say, even the dust of your, of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. So there, are, there were going to be uh, t uh, people that did not receive our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that in some ways a kindness our Lord is extending to his disciples? 
not promising that every place would receive him uh, joyfully, but in fact war giving, giving really clear uh, indication that some would reject him. And that still is true today throughout, throughout the Bible as we have it today, but also in our own experience. There is only one of two responses to the Lord Jesus Christ. Either we receive him with joy, we trust in him, we uh, set our hearts upon him, our affections upon him as our Savior, because only he has died for our sins, only he did live a perfect life uh, that we might have his righteousness. And so we either receive him as our Savior, placing our trust in him, or we reject uh, the this, this Savior of the world. And so Jesus is preparing his disciples, and they are to even wipe the dust off as to remain behind as if to show as a sign that even the dust will be there when the judgment day occurs. And so uh, there, is, um, there is really quite, uh, quite a, um, a grave warning against th th those cities. We see in verse 12, he says, those towns, uh, in those towns, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than in those towns that, re that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not to say Sodom was, it was going to be a good place to be on the day of judgment. It's not. But there are different degrees of, of judgment, and, and as one commentator has said, on the severity level, on the severity index, it's going to be worse for those towns that rejected the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ than even those in Sodom. So those are the instructions that the 72 receive. And then look, uh, we, then, we then look into the next uh, section here um, in verses 13 to 16. There is a mention here of some cities, three cities, and there's a warning here about unbelief in those cities in verses 13 to 16. These communities are not too far away from where Jesus spent some of his earthly ministry. They're, they're somewhere north of the Sea of Galilee, or north, some of them closer and some further away from the border of, of the Sea of Galilee, but they're close by. There are places where Jesus in his ministry, his earthly ministry, would have gone, would have preached, would have perhaps uh, healed some. They would have known about the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at what we read here. We read that, in fact, there is a woe given to each of these cities because even though they had the privilege of being uh, receiving the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, they did not receive him, him, but they did reject him. So that again tells us that there is a, there's a, there's a great grave warning to those who reject the preaching of God's word. The 72 were not just going out on an advertising campaign or just giving people interesting things to think about, but rather they were going with the words of life and the receiving or the rejecting of those words had um, very, very significant uh, consequences. Jesus mentions these three cities, and um, it's interesting, actually, uh, to think about uh, Chorazin. You probably haven't come across that city anywhere else, and yet uh, Luke tells us that Jesus must have done great things in that city. So in that sense, it's a good reminder that we, we don't know everything about Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, John, in his gospel, the very end of his gospel, records that if everything was written about what Jesus did while in his ministry on the earth, the world couldn't contain all the books. And so that's a good example here that uh, Chorazin is one of those cities. Jesus probably went many other places as well. Uh, but um, he went there, he went to Bethsaida, he went to Capernaum. And uh, Matthew Henry points out in his commentary that the residents of these communities enjoyed greater privileges. Christ's mighty works have been done in these communities, gracious works, works of mercy, works of healing, teaching about the truth of God's word. And, and, uh, and, John, and, and yet, uh, even though they, they did uh, hear these words and they, uh, they saw... Uh, the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they, did not, they, did not, uh, they did not believe him. Uh, that says that Jesus Christ today, if he were to return today and he were to walk into downtown Modesto, 
and were preached on the corner, there would still be some today that would not receive him unless, of course, the Holy Spirit uh, gives them a new heart and a new life. And again, there is a, a comparison here uh, with, uh, with other cities, Tyre and Sidon. These are cities that were pagan cities. They're spoken about in the, in the Old Testament. Their wickedness, their arrogance is made clear in, by the prophet Isaiah and also in Ezekiel. And yet, again, on the severity index, those cities will receive a less severe judgment than these cities that saw the work of our Lord and heard his word preached. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stark reminder to us. Perhaps today there are some, even in, a, even in our church or in our circles, perhaps children of believers or friends of believers who have had the privilege of sitting under the preaching of God's word and have had the privilege of seeing uh, the explanation of God's word or of sat in the fellowship of God's people. And it's a good reminder that it's not enough to be nearby of the Savior, not enough to, to observe him from afar, but we must indeed uh, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must confess our sins. We must, we must uh, put our, our trust in him. Only then uh, can uh, we uh, know that we uh, that, that we can have a relationship with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, J.C. Ryle says, um, again, these passages teach us the exceeding hardness and the unbelief of the human heart. It, was possi it is possible here that the Lord Jesus Christ preach and see his miracles and yet remain unconverted. So wherever the Lord Jesus Christ is, is preached in verse 16 and received, they are receiving Jesus Christ himself when he is rejected. It is as if the Lord Jesus Christ is rejected. Good thing to remember as we are in church each Lord's Day. When the pastor comes into this pulpit, when Pastor Sean comes into this pulpit and preaches the word, remember that he is preaching with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as if his word is being spoken to you. Thirdly, we have in verses 17 and 20... Uh, a response of faith, 17 through 20. Now, in verse 17, um, we, we read that the 72 returned with joy. And um, uh, Dale Ralph Davis, a commentator on, this, on uh, Luke's gospel, says, we have, and I liked his word, we have a narrative gap here. We have a narrative gap because Jesus tells us about the preparation of the 72 going out um, but we don't know much about what happened, and suddenly they're back. They're back, but they're back with joy. And they, they come with joy, and they, they give this ex, uh, exclamation, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And note the response of our Lord. Uh, uh, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so here we see uh, the significance of the disciples' work, uh, not only were they going out uh, telling people about the coming of the kingdom, they were healing people, but as they're healing, as they're uh, proclaiming the word of the Lord, they're chipping away at Satan's empire. Satan is beginning to fail. Now, it's not an absolute defeat, of course. Satan is not defeated, but there is a, there is a, there is a little a glimpse of the defeat of Satan in this passage. Uh, of course, Satan will, will be defeated. We have great confidence of this. The Word of God tells us about that. It will be when our Lord returns, but it was started long ago and has continued even through this, through the, the ministry of these 72. And so we give, we give thanks to see that uh, Satan is, is, uh, will not stand. And so Jesus um, uh, is assuring the disciples of, of the, the authority they have. It says, he says, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. Now, does that mean that um, the apostle James is not going to be beheaded by Herod Agrippa? No, that's clearly that's going to happen. Does that mean that uh, Saul is not going to be uh, stoned to within an inch of his life in Lystra? No, that, that would happen too. And of course, there are many other things that are happen, will happen. But the point is that 
what is necessary for the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ will be accomplished. Satan will not stop it. And his, um, his workers will have authority to continue to act in his name. And by his uh, gracious providence, uh, he will sustain that work until, until the very end. So the disciples have returned with great joy. And perhaps they were, they, their joy was because of these great things that had happened. But note what Jesus points out to his disciples. Does he say they should be, they should be uh, joyful because of the healing, because of the demons, etc.? He says, no, nevertheless, verse 20, rejoice in what? Rejoice in this, that the, the, subjects are, the, the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Do not rejoice that the, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are are written in heaven. What should his disciples be giving praise and joy for? It's that their names are written in the book of life. That's really what should give us uh, joy and should cause us to worship and praise the Lord as well. Sometimes we'd like to see more work. We'd like to see Satan defeated. We'd like to see um, the gospel advance even more. And we, we should pray for that, but we should start by giving thanks uh, for the fact that our names are written in the book of life. Well, finally, we come to the end of this portion of Scripture in, in verse 21, uh, and we have what, what uh, I would say is the joy of Jesus. And it says Jesus rejoices in the, in the Holy Spirit. The 72 have returned, and Jesus now erupts in, in joy. It's kind of interesting to think about that, verse 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to, to little children or to babes. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Uh, this is an interesting uh, verse for, for, uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, of course, Jesus is rejoicing. Sometimes we think of, a man of Jesus being the man of sorrows. And of course, much of the time he is the man of sorrows, grieving over the, the sin of the world, over the rejection of his ministry. But here, here Jesus does rejoice in that very hour, rejoicing in the defeat of Satan. For nothing would, of course, give our Savior more joy than to see the gospel advanced and the harvest brought in. But second, we see also the Trinity in this verse. It's good to be looking for the Trinity uh, throughout uh, uh, the Bible as you read through it, and you see a mention, of course, of the Holy Spirit and Jesus praying to the Father. So we have the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Third, we, we see how Jesus is, is praising his Father and why he's praising his Father. Why is he praising the Father? Well, I think in one way we could say he's praising the Father not for what was accomplished, but perhaps how it is accomplished. See, this is, again, the marvel, I think, of, of God's way. He's uh, giving praise for the fact that these disciples go out, perhaps not the, the best trained. I know, know, we don't know anything about the 72, but probably they're fishermen, they're tax collectors, they're some of those that have been uh, brought to uh, Jesus' ministry and are following him. They're not the wise, they're not the learned. They're going forth, they're giving this simple message about the coming of the kingdom and God's Spirit is working through them. And who is coming to knowledge? Who is coming to receive that word? And it's, it's, it says here that it's, it's being revealed to little children. Uh, it's being revealed to those that perhaps aren't the learned, who aren't the most scholarly. I think uh, perhaps uh, one of the better uh, commentaries on this passage would be 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you, if you have your Bibles there, you can turn there with me just briefly to verse 26. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see verse 26. For Paul, writing to the Corinthians, writes this, for, you, for consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, 
so that no human might boast in the presence of God. So there, there is, again, a great reminder that God works his way in perhaps unexpected ways. He's using not the most talented or the most eloquent, perhaps. We don't know. But what Jesus says is that the, the way in which the, 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 the Lord is working here, the Spirit is working, is to reveal it to those who are, who are like babes or like little children. And that's, that's really, a, I think, a pattern we should have in our own prayer life, in our own, in our own walk with the Lord. We should have an eye for how, the God, how God is working around us. Sometimes God will use um, perhaps insignificant means to accomplish uh, His way. We can think of a number of examples in Scripture uh, in that regard. Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers, then sold into slavery in Egypt. But God used that to, of course, sustain uh, Jacob and his entire family and enable them to grow. And as after they became enslaved, of course, they were uh, God led them out of out of uh, Egypt. But God used uh, what would be perhaps an unusual means by which Joseph would rise to a, a position of power. Or um, God would use uh, in, uh, in, at Jericho, uh, Joshua leading the people of God around the city seven times with only lamps and trumpets. What an unusual way to take possession of the city, but that was the way that God was working. Or David um, uh, defeating Goliath with a single stone and, and a sling. You, you kind of get the idea that God will use different ways, and uh, you should have your eyes open to the way in which the Lord is working for. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways, for the heavens are higher uh, than the earth, so are His ways higher than uh, our ways and His thoughts than our thoughts. So let's give praise to God as we see that, that uh, how it works, how He works through these different means. And we see how this carries over into uh, verse 22 of uh, Luke chapter 10, Jesus' attitude of praise is, uh, is one that speaks about his relationship with the Father and the Son. And, and, and we see here that uh, no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And so here we see at the very end of this text that um, only those that are going to know the Lord Jesus Christ are the ones that the Lord Jesus Christ chooses to reveal himself. So that's a question we need to always ask ourselves. Has the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to you this day? If he has, have you responded to him in faith? Are you seeking to walk with him? Are you seeking to, uh, to turn your life over to him so that you may glorify him? You know, not everybody likes the idea that that choice is not in our hands. You know, sometimes we think, well, uh, it's okay for Jesus to have this authority over demons and have uh, his authority over other circumstances, but we don't always like it when he has authority over our lives. Um, and again, uh, I mentioned Ralph Davis, and he says in his commentary, um, normally, I'm just quoting from him, normally we might not mind Jesus having authority, but there's a rebel streak in the human spirit that chafes at his having that much authority. There's a story about Abraham Lincoln. This is, again, Ralph Davis telling this. Dealing with a dispute in a cabinet meeting. At the end of the disagreement in which he had been outvoted, he announced, this again, Abraham Lincoln announced seven nays, one eye. The eyes have it. Now, he, knew, he could do the math that way because he was the president of the United States. And so he could make that decision. And, of course, that's, that's true uh, with our lives before the Lord. Our, they, our Heavenly Father uh, ultimately makes these, uh, makes, uh, determines all things and according to the counsel of his own will. And that might rankle some of us, but those of us who are little children or babes as, uh, who's had this word revealed to them, has, has trusted in it by faith and is seeking to live for him, will bow down and worship. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have come.